Are you having a hard time figuring out what to get dad for Father's Day? You should check out Row One Brand's Vintage Pictorum Gallery. They have America's best sports art. With over 7,200 historic sports prints, you're assured to find something unique for dad this Father's Day. Instead of a boring old tie, get him a historic baseball photo taken by Henry High Sandum at the historic Polo Ground Stadium in New York City during the 1894 Temple Cup. Or, if he's an NFL buff, check out the 1963 vintage NFL poster. These are so good looking that you'll be amazed how they turn out. Shop now at sportshistorynetwork.com slash row one and save 15% off your order. Welcome back to Basketball History 101. This is Rick Loiza in studio with my producer and editor, Jacob Loiza. How are you doing today, Jacob? Good. How are you doing, Dad? I'm doing well. I'm doing well. So uh, today's topic is a streetball player from the 60s and very early 70s by the name of Earl Manigault. That's right. So Manigault, he never played in the NBA. So what about him made him so special that he deserves an episode of Basketball History 101? Well, some consider him the greatest player, or at least or one of the greatest players of all time, even though he didn't play in the NBA. Uh, and I get into this in the episode, but he had played uh, street ball, or he played um, on the New York courts. He had played with Will Chamberlain. He played with Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. He played with Connie Hawkins, Earl Monroe. These are all Hall of Fame, NBA Hall of Famers that Manigault had either played with or against on the public basketball courts in New York City, and they all thought that he was one of the best players they had ever seen. Wow, so he became famous just off the playground? Yeah, so it's, it's different. Like in New York City, playing on the playground can actually get somebody quite a bit of fame, just being a, a very strong playground player. He was a strong playground player, and he actually became famous within the city of New York, within that culture and that community. He was probably one of the best known players of his day, and having played with and against NBA players, he established a very strong reputation. People said he actually dominated NBA players on the playground. So if he was so good, why wasn't he in the NBA himself? Well, that, again, I'll get into in the episode, but the short of it is he had some issues with the way he made his life decisions, had some issues with drugs, with uh, issues with the law, and he kind of, in some ways... Uh, undermined his own efforts. He kind of was, in some ways, his own worst enemy. Uh, he definitely had the skill. Nobody ever questioned his skill or his talent. It was really just a matter of the direction he was going and and got, getting himself into trouble with uh, with with some different different uh, uh, bad crowds. That's fascinating. Well, let's get into the episode then. All right, let's do it. This is Basketball History 101 with Rick Loiza. Welcome back to Basketball History 101, part of the Sports History Network. I am your host, Rick Loiza, and this is the podcast where we bring to life some of the forgotten stories from basketball history. And today, we are going to talk about one of the most legendary players of all time. And he didn't even play in the NBA. In fact, he never played professionally anywhere. And when I use the word legendary... I mean it in the dictionary definition type of way. The word legend means a story that is unverifiable. And that's exactly what we have here. The legend of Earl Manigault is so huge that it's difficult to distinguish fact from fiction. Very little of his career is on film, so we have to go with eyewitness testimony. But some of these stories seem so exaggerated that it starts to become legend. What was real? What wasn't real? We don't completely know, but we do know this. After Kareem Abdul-Jabbar retired from the NBA, the Lakers had a jersey retirement ceremony for him. He was asked who was the greatest player he ever played with or against, and he thought for a moment. Now remember, Kareem played for 20 years in the NBA. He played with or against practically half of the players in the Hall of Fame at the time. He played with Magic Johnson and Oscar Robertson as his point guard. Think about that for a moment. He played against Will Chamberlain, Willis Reed, George Gervin, Wes Unseld, Akeem Olajuwon, Robert Parrish, 
Michael Jordan, Larry Bird, Jerry West, Bill Walton, and Elgin Baylor, just to name a few. So, who was the answer to the question of the best player he ever played against? The answer was Earl the Goat Manigault. So who is this guy they call the goat that Kareem thinks so highly of? Born on September 7, 1944 in Charleston, South Carolina, Manigault was actually raised in Harlem, New York. And from the first time he touched a basketball, he seemed to have a natural talent for the game. Now this isn't necessarily unusual, most all of the great players ever had a natural gift for the game. You can go back to Will Chamberlain or Kareem, Dr. J, Magic Johnson, Iverson or LeBron. Each of these guys was just playing better than everybody else at their age. And from the time they started playing, they just were really, really good. And Manigault falls into this category. In eighth grade, when he was around 13 years old, he set the New York City record for most points scored in a game for that age group. He scored 57 points in a junior high school game in the mid-1950s. He was never particularly tall like so many of the other great players. His full adult height is somewhere between 5'11 and 6'1. That's about 180 to 185 centimeters. But what he could always do was jump like he had pogo sticks for legs. He then moved on to play basketball for Benjamin Franklin High School and tore up the high school competition. But before graduating high school, he would begin to get involved with the wrong crowd and started taking illegal drugs. He would eventually get kicked out of school and had to finish his schooling at a private academy called Laurenburg Institute in North Carolina. He played just one year at the academy and he averaged 31 points per game. You see, the issue with Manigault was never his talent or ability. The issue was the choices he made in life. And unfortunately, he made many, many bad choices. So once he was done at the academy, he then enrolled in Johnson C. Smith University, which was also in North Carolina, but he left the school before the basketball season even began because he struggled with his schoolwork and continuously argued with his head coach. So back to Harlem, except now he has no official team to play for. And like so many other New York City basketball players, he found competition in the various parks and public courts throughout the city. And that's where his legend really began to grow. So how did he get the nickname, The Goat? Like any good legend, there are various accounts of how he got that nickname. And we'll discuss that right after this break. This podcast is part of the Sports History Network, your headquarters for the yesteryear of your favorite sport. You can learn more at sportshistorynetwork.com. Welcome back, and let's keep going on with Earl Manigault and how he got his nickname, The Goat. Like any good legend, there are several accounts of how it happened. Some say that it was a simple mispronunciation of his name, Manigault. Some people thought that his name was Manigoat. Some say it was because he was often found playing at Happy Warrior Playground on Amsterdam Avenue and West 99th, right behind PS 163, and that park was also known as Goat Park. But the answer that most people attest to is that the GOAT is an acronym for the greatest of all time, which is why you often hear Michael Jordan referred to as the GOAT. But regardless of its origin, Manigault carried the nickname the GOAT before anyone else did. He had a move that many people say they witnessed called the double dunk. Basically, he would jump up and dunk the ball with his right hand while he was on his way up. He would then catch the ball with his left hand as it came through the net, transfer it to his right hand, and dunk it again while he was on his way back down to the ground. If it's true, that is the most incredible dunk I have ever heard of. But again, that is the legend of Manigault. There is another story that he once drove to the basket and jumped between two defenders and spun completely around twice and then finished with a dunk. According to witnesses, he pulled off a 720 and then dunked it. That's two 360s while in the air. Did it actually happen? I don't know. 
you get the idea of where these stories tend to go. But Manigault himself refuted the double dunk and the 720 dunk. But I have to admit that there's a part of me that really wants to believe it. I want this to be true. I mean, maybe Manigault was just being modest and the stories actually happened the way that so many people say they did. I mean, who knows? In the summer of 1965, he teamed up with Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, who had just graduated from high school and was only 18 years old, and they did really well together in the famous Rucker Tournament. Of course, Kareem was still going by his given name back then, Lou Alcindor, but I'm going to keep referring to him as Kareem just for the sake of consistency. And the tournament, simply known as the Rucker, is a massive summer basketball tournament that takes place on New York City playground courts every summer. The tournament is open to anyone, amateur or professional. And back then, it was not uncommon to see NBA players playing in this tournament. Manigault also teamed up with Connie Hawkins at other Rucker tournaments. He and Hawkins once had to play a game against Wilt Chamberlain and Earl Monroe. That's three Hall of Famers in a, on a basketball court, a public basketball court. And according to witnesses, it was Manigault who dominated the game against these three future Hall of Famers. As a side note, Earl Monroe actually had two nicknames. In the NBA, he was known as Earl the Pearl, but on the playground, everybody called him by a street name, Black Jesus. So again, this was back in the day when some of the top NBA players played in this tournament alongside amateur teammates each summer. You don't see that too often today. Some NBA players play in the Drew League out in Los Angeles each summer, and every now and then an NBA player will play in the Rucker Tournament in New York like Kevin Durant or Kobe Bryant, but it's really rare. The reason is that it's often not worth it for these multi-million dollar athletes to risk playing against other players who have a chip on their shoulder or who really want to prove something against NBA competition. There's just too much risk for injury. But back then, you would see Kareem, Will Chamberlain, Dr. J, and others regularly at the summer tournament. It was definitely a sight to behold. Now, getting back to Manigault, the biggest struggle in his life was his struggle with drugs. He was twice jailed because of that struggle. Once for possession of drugs, and then again for armed robbery. So basically, he found himself in and out of jail, which is not a great thing if you want to advance your basketball career. But due to a lack of proper training, his ongoing battle with drugs, and his lack of availability, he had to give up playing the game at a relatively young age. Again, without formal records, it's hard to tell when he actually stopped playing. But it was definitely on the younger side. I mean, nobody keeps a box score for a playground game. As he got a little older and got his life under more control, he organized a few tournaments on the playground parks of New York. One was called the Goat Tournament, and another one was called Walk Away From Drugs Tournament. Both served as fundraisers to help spread the message to kids about avoiding drugs. And he would often share his story with the young players that participated in these tournaments. He didn't want to see other players follow in his footsteps. As the 1990s rolled around, he began to experience serious heart problems. And he was relatively young in the fact that he was in his late 40s and early 50s. But his body could not handle the abuse that he had put it through. And he eventually passed away in 1998 at Mount Sinai Hospital in New York from congestive heart failure. That was the sad ending to the life of a man that many people said was the greatest player they had ever seen. He would often outshine NBA players at those record tournaments. People would often ask why Manigault wasn't playing in the NBA. It was obvious that he was as gifted as many of the NBA All-Stars. But sometimes things go awry in life. Sometimes it's by circumstance, and sometimes it's because of bad choices. Sometimes it's a combination of both. But it would have been nice to see Manigault get his life under control just long enough to be seen on an NBA roster. But it wasn't meant to be. But he had the respect of many NBA players of his era. They knew that on the playground court, he was as good as any NBA All-Star. They respected his game. And I guess that's all you can really ask for. Respect. And that's where we'll have to leave it. 
that's our story on Earl the Goat Manigault. So join us next week when we profile Jerry Colangelo and his impact on Team USA basketball and basketball in general. You won't want to miss that story. That's next time on Basketball History 101, part of the Sports History Network. If you like what you hear, please hit that subscribe button wherever you get your podcasts and check out our page on Facebook. It's called Basketball History 101 Podcast. There you will find shorter historical posts as well as comments and discussion starters on today's game. I'll also announce there when new episodes come out. I want to thank my producer and editor, Jacob Loiza. Join us each week as we continue to mine the history of basketball for more great stories from the past. And don't forget to check out SportsHistoryNetwork.com for more information on my podcast and the rest of the podcast on our network. Take care and see you soon. We here at the Sports History Network proudly partner with 26 podcasts, all revolving around the history of sports. But did you know that many of our hosts were sports history authors way before they started their shows? It's true. We've got Joe Ziemba, host of When Football Was Football. Joe Zagurski, host of Pro Football in the 1970s. Mark Morthier, host of Yesterday Sports. Tommy Phillips, host of Lombardi Memories. And Scott Adamson, co-host of From the 55-Yard Line. All these authors have many books for you to choose from. To check them out, go to our website at sportshistorynetwork.com slash sportshistorybooks. Pick up your copy today! Soundtrack provided by Kevin McLeod of filmmusic.io.